Raja Bell is our guest on the FIU Athletics Podcast. Uh, really glad we could have you on, Raja. Of course, a, a terrific career at, at FIU from 97 through 99. Uh, and then going on, of course, to a very successful NBA career. Raja, thanks for coming on, but I appreciate it. Hey, thanks for having me, man. I appreciate you reaching out. Exciting time of year for you right now. Uh, as, an, as an alum of the Suns Clippers playoff series, I know you're locked into that. Uh, I'm not going to ask ask you or put you on the spot about anything coaching wise, but I, I'm seeing your names on the, sh- on the short list on the athletic the other day. Uh, you were just on Colin Coward's show. You have your own show, of course, the real ones with Raja and Logan on uh, the Ringer podcast and, and, and some exciting things for your family as well. It seems like things are staying pretty fun and busy for you right now. Yeah, we, uh, Hey man, I have, uh, I got four kids. They range from 14 to four. Um, <laughs> So I'm busy, you know, regardless, but yeah. it is a busy time of year. There's a lot of cool stuff uh, to watch basketball kind of being first and foremost for me. And, you know, I'm locked into these playoffs. It's been really, you know, they've been, they've been great to watch. They've been fun to watch. There've been a lot of kind of twists and turns due to injuries. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of subplots going on. And so it's, it's been really fun, man. I, I, I can't front. I am actually looking forward to watching NBA games and believe it or not, I don't say that all the time, but I'm locked in. Like I don't really? miss them. So it's pretty cool. Why do, you, why do you say that's interesting? I'll follow up on that. Why, what uh, you said, maybe not locked in all the time. What do you think leads to that? Why yeah, that? I, I, well, I mean, there's a little fatigue. Like once you've done something for that long um, right. and you've played it uh, as long as I did, it, you can't watch every game, right? Like so during the, during the regular season, I'm probably like a lot of folks where it's a marquee matchup and I pop in and check it out. I mean, clearly, you know, once I started having a podcast revolving around basketball, it, it requires me to watch more basketball. Um but but this offseason, um, I'm locked into almost every game. When in years past, I'd pop in on a series here and there. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think they're more exciting teams. Um, you know, Atlanta's been fantastic to watch. Brooklyn, you know, even minus Kyrie was awesome to see what KD was going to be able to do. The Suns are always a favorite of mine, uh, watching the evolution of that kind of team. And James Jones being another local guy from Florida, I'm pulling for him. So there are a lot of things that, that just have me connected this year uh, in a way that I haven't really been. Yeah, we'll get we'll get to that in your time with Phoenix and that in a little bit. But I, I want to start. I want to rewind, of course, uh, to, to maybe some aspects we haven't heard as much. For, I, you have you, we love listening to you on Canel and and Bell before, and then obviously on on the Ringer podcast now. But maybe folks haven't heard as much about your time before that before the NBA uh, and before FIU as well. Let's go back to the the high school days. Uh, oh. I, I think I think you gra- you graduated from Killian, but yeah. you spent time at Gulliver for a period of time before that. So how, how long were you at Gulliver and then you went to Killian? Is that correct? Yeah. Wow, yeah, you went you, you dropped us in the way back. Uh, yeah, um, I, <laughs> so yeah, when I, so when I came over from the Virgin Islands, I was about 13, I was in the eighth grade. Um, yeah. And we lived kind of on University of Miami while my dad was working on his doctorate and trying to finish that up. And so I went to Ponce de Leon Middle back when middle was eighth and ninth grade. So you didn't get your ninth grade season in high school. Uh, It didn't mean much to me then, but now for records and and stuff like that, I would have wished I got it. But I I went to Ponce for eighth and ninth, and then I spent my 10th grade year over at Gulliver Pratt. Um, Mark Schusterman, who's, I think, uh, helping out Courtney Young over at Riviera now was the basketball coach. Yeah. Yeah, um, and he was I, great. I think, man. We'll, we'll talk about that after because I'm right, over at Riviera tough. too. So we'll talk about that. <laughs> All right, that's tough. so Shu was yeah. great, man. Like he, you yeah. know, he made sure I got where I needed to go and kind of helped me out. Um, you know, and, and got us into school. It was a great experience. I just at, at, at Gulliver, I didn't know what the what the future was going to look like. Like you know, right. for for me personally, and at that point, my goal was to play college basketball. So I transferred to Killian as a junior. Um, okay with coach Bob Kaufman, great teams, man. Like Warren yeah. Anderson, good friends of mine, like Kit Zielinski, um, you know, some really good players, Dwayne Thompson, Eric Passon, really good players over there. Um, and then, uh, you know, that's what it was. So my high school career was, was kind of one year at Gulliver and then two over Killian. When you graduated in 94, uh, FIU had just gone 11 and 16, finished sixth in their, their conference at the time. Ha- had you considered FIU at all? Had you been recruited by by Bob Weltlich before deciding uh, to head up to, to Boston University? Was was FIU originally in the picture? You spent two years at BU, but, but how was that process coming out of Killian? Yeah, absolutely not. As a, uh, <laughs> and, and no, and I don't mean this in a disrespect. Uh, Coach sure. Weltlich and their staff did not recruit me at all, at, yeah. like not one bit. Um, and so that I mean Miami didn't either. So it wasn't it wasn't like they were 
the only team in the market that didn't have any interest in me. They were, right. you know, neither team in my hometown did. And so I would go to like five star and stuff like that in the, in the summers, trying to create a little bit of buzz and show people out of state um, what I could do. So, you know, Boston was one of the teams on me really early my junior year um, after yeah. a five star showing. And then, you know, my, my junior year, I was averaging like 15 a game. And then my senior year, I averaged almost 28 a game. So bigger schools started to come into the fray at that point. You know, the LSUs of the world and, and the temples and, and Georgetown came down. But I felt really comfortable at Boston University. They recruited me early. I knew I'd play right away. Um, right. I didn't feel like they were kind of selling me a dream. And, you know, believe it or not, FIU just wasn't, you know, they weren't interested in me at the time. So I, I had yeah. to go over it. You were you were successful at BU on the floor, the the American East freshman of the well back the the North Atlantic Conference. But yeah. you've talked before about why you made the decision to leave the Boston area. So then after that, what was the process then with FIU getting in touch with you? They that they seemed unswayed by anything coming out of BU. They wanted you, and Shaky was just getting started there. How, how did they kind of uh, enter the picture? And I know playing in front of family had to mean something to you, but but how? How, how did that all get started? Yeah, it was, it's, it's a funny story because, uh, you know, back in the day, this is before your time, I'm sure, there was a big summer <laughs> pro-am league they called the Farm Ed League that was run out of out of uh, the arena down there at FIU. And so all the guys that were home, Miami guys, FIU guys, right, and local guys that had went away to play other places were kind of scattered amongst a bunch of teams. And you played in this pro-am for like, I don't know, six weeks. So I was in there hooping one night. I did not know Shake had got the job. Um, I, I flirted with the idea about playing for Shaky Rodriguez at Miami High and then chose to go to Killian. But, mm-hmm. And he had coached me in an AAU tournament, but I didn't know he was at FIU. So, you know, I was in there playing really well. Um, and he was like leaning on the wall over in the corner. And, you know, in only the way Shaky could do it, he called me over and, you know, gave me a hug and dabbed me up. And we were chopping it up. And he said, hey, man, I, you know, I know you got a bunch of people that are interested in you. Um, I don't know what that looks like, but we want to be the most exciting team in college basketball. That's my goal. And he referenced Loyola Marymount, uh, the way they got up and down. He said, we'd like to lead the country at scoring. Um, Mm -hmm. We're going to play this fast paced style of ball. Uh, We're going to really try to create a buzz at FIU. And he was like, Raj, I think you're the perfect person to do it. I'd love to put the ball in your hands and let you do what you do. Um, And it was, it was an interesting pitch because I had, I had bigger schools um, that were interested at the time, but you know, I got, I got a chance to stay at home. I knew the style of play was going to fit what I wanted to do. And no one was really telling you at that time that, hey, man, we want you to be the guy that makes it happen. And so, right. you know, as an 18-year-old coming out of a situation where I didn't feel like I was getting enough love and enough touches, I mean, he was speaking my language, right? And so I was already in the gym. It was a great atmosphere. You know, it was kind of packed in there for the farm eds. It just all made sense for me. Yeah, that's a good point. Maybe at that point in time, mid nineties, the the pitch of "Hey, you're the guy. You're our number one. You're going to come in as a young guy and, and lead our team." Maybe that wasn't as commonplace, and so that 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 could seem really appealing when when you feel like you've been undervalued. Well, he got he got me, and um, <laughs> you know, shape what I knew about shape. You know, my dad was a ref, and I when I grew up, uh, like I said, when I came over like in the eighth grade, I tag along and go to the gym to watch my dad ref the high school game. Yeah. So I knew I knew his guy. Steve Edwards was someone that, you know, I always patterned my game after and wanted to be, you know, as good as, if not better than. And so, you know, Pancho Parkinson and and uh, Jimmel Martinez, Devin Davis, like all of those guys were were I was a fan of theirs coming up. Right. And so I knew how Shake's teams played. I knew what he put stock in. Um, and I knew that he had the support of the school. Um, there was there was a, you know, kind of a groundswell of support for Shake um, in the community to get that FIU job and the support that he needed and the resources that he needed to try to bring some of us back. Cause it wasn't just right. me. You brought, you know, one of my, one of my good friends, Damian McKnight back from Penn state, mm-hmm. um, Darius Cook who had played at Northwestern, Sam Watts who had played at Northwestern. Um, you know, Dedrick Taylor was already there who was, I think a North Miami beach kid. Um, and then some of my good friends from out of town, that are really good players, Gene right. Durkak, Anthony Harris and the like, but <laughs> the point was shout out to everybody though. You see, I was smooth with there, that, right? There was good. That was good right there. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> that was good. Yeah. Shake was getting the support that he needed and yeah. it was home and the pitch was, you know, shaky-esque. Yeah. Shaky, shaky was, all, was certainly well known throughout the Miami high school circuit. He's won five state championships. Uh, shaky Rodriguez, for those that don't know, Shaky passed away last November. He's our coach at FIU 
for five seasons, but just a staple of South Florida basketball, of high school basketball, and then, of course, was successful at FIU. Roger, what were your impressions? You said you knew him. What were your impressions of Shakey when you started at FIU, once you got there? And then how did that relationship develop through the years? Yeah, it's an interest. That's an interesting question. So my impression, having played for Shake um, briefly on the AAU circuit, like I said, a tournament, and just knowing being in his gyms growing up, yeah, was just a no nonsense um, disciplinarian who prided himself on toughness and physicality, and just you know a style of play that I grew up playing here in Miami. We're we're kind of unique as a basketball culture. You know, you mm-hmm. probably know that AJ. Like we. You know, we're not like New York where everybody's got the ball on a string and, you know, these different places. I mean, we're some hard hat wearing, like, get down in the mud type of players. And I always like that. And so, you know, that was my impression of Shake. But when I got to FIU, uh, he didn't disappoint in that regard. Uh, I think our mantra was RP40, which was relentless pressure over 40 minutes. And and <laughs> we trained to do that. We lifted yeah. to do that. Um, we But I got to see a side of Shake that I didn't know, right? Like, I got to see the family man. Um yeah. I got to become part of the family. So like that, that affection and that soft side was, was, uh, was accessible to me at times. Cause I, you know, I didn't have the smoothest transition academically to FIU. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I was home. There were a lot of distractions. I, I wasn't sure. doing great. And, you know, shake, you know, I'm blessed to have a great father, but, but, but shake was there also to kind of help explain to me like, Hey man, like this is an opportunity that you are, you are blowing right now. Like you have to tighten up and here's what we need you to do. And so, you know, I got to see a different side of Shake in that regard. I mean, on the court, he was who I thought he was, but you know, he was he was a different guy behind closed doors. That's that's fascinating. You see, basketball reference is a great thing. So, looking at basketball reference, <laughs> you see, look at your stat line. It's it seems like you were doing well on the court, I mean, sixteen a game. But yeah. right then, you mentioned Shakey's telling Shake's telling you you're blowing it. Where where was the contract? Are you referring to maybe academics or or did, yeah. did you see your potential was even was even higher than what you were showing on the court? No, I think what happened. I got you know back then you couldn't just transfer and be be playing right away, right? But and you so had a year to sit. Yeah, that's I right. had to sit. Yeah. And in that year, um, I was a part of the team, but I wasn't. So yeah. when they would go away on road trips, I I was left to just kind of fend for myself at FIU. And and for those if they're listening that that, have, that know the campus today. Um, I was down there with my son at the football, uh, you know, touring the football facilities the other day. And I was showing, I was showing him like how incredible that campus is back then. It wasn't like that. And so there weren't many people on campus except these, these um, small apartments. So real talk, AJ, when they would go away and I would have this downtime, I just wasn't taking care of my business academically. I wasn't, I was distracted. There were too many things for me to get into not enough structure at the time. And, um, you know, I could have cost myself those two seasons you're talking about by being a, a young, dumb kid. And and Shake was really, you know, integral in making sure I didn't do that. Yeah, it's funny. The, that practice field you were on is just a bunch of trees, a bunch, bunch of swamp and forest. Right. <laughs> before. Right. And you're like, right. and this is kind of cool now. That, that's yeah. fun. Uh, you, were, you were on, I mean, those those two years, particularly, I think, 97, 98, I mean, you, you were on some good teams. You were on a, a, a squad that beat Alabama on the road. You beat Penn State. A lot of FIU fans who followed the program for a long time, they'll always reference the Michigan game in 98. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, and Arroyo, you and Carlos Arroyo combined for 40, largest crowd in history. Uh, interesting, Michigan even decided to not buy out that game and, and come down yeah. and play it. They thought we guys, were kidding. They thought it yeah, was yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, giving them a scare the year before. But uh, to 97-98, you're 21-8, and 13-0. and 0 at home. And like we said before, 16 points per game. What do you remember about the 97, 98 season? I, I didn't even really put together until I was really doing pre- research. You guys didn't get beat at, at home. Like that, that's outstanding. Yeah. What do you remember yeah. about that year? So that was the second year, right? You, yeah. I think that was the first year you played, but second year you were there. Yeah. So the first year I played. All right, cool. The first, the first year I played, um, I remember just being, you know, out of my mind to get on the court and show everybody, you know, at BU and places where I were, it didn't work out that, that I was a guy or, yeah. you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. that was my focus. Um, and as a team, I remember looking around knowing what was out there. Cause I had been at other schools and having teammates also that had been in other schools 
um, talking amongst ourselves and being like, we could be anybody. Like this is, this isn't like hyperbole. Like we could walk into a building and, and, and beat you. And, you know, that was just who we were. We weren't afraid. Shaky scheduled any and everybody. He wasn't afraid. Yeah. He um, <laughs> sometimes to a fault, but, but well, that's I mean, what I was going to say next. I mean, you, you played Maryland at Michigan, a- Alabama, Notre Dame, Villanova, yeah. all on the road. If anything, you're ready for conference play after that because you only lost three regular season games after those. Yeah. We were ready to go, man. We loved playing at home. Like we had great, we had great support. I, I took real pride in playing, you know, at home and seeing my name again in the Herald and seeing our team in the Herald and seeing like the success that Shake was starting to carve out there. So, you know, there was a lot of us or there were a lot of us that felt like that because we were hometown kids. Um, you know, it was just when, when we got to college at Charleston in that championship, we had a scare against Georgia State, I think, in the, in the semis. I did not play well at all, but my teammates held me down. Um, and then college at Charleston. Um, it, it was, a, it, they were a great team. Um, yeah. If they had been in a major conference, they would have been, they would have been a top 20 team perennially. They just, you know, that we were in the tack at the time. Um, and they had this unique gym where the, the fans were right on the floor and it was rated, I guess, you know, one year as like the second toughest building to play in maybe third behind the pit and behind Cameron indoor. It was electric. Right. Uh, and they beat us there. And we really felt like AJ, we should have got a, maybe not an at large. That was too much to ask for, but an NIT bid. Yeah, and yeah. yeah, we kind of got let down on that. And that was, that was a tough blow to swallow. So we went, you know, we went back to work that off season um, right, right. to try to prove some people wrong. And if I may say so, I know for a fact, Shake did his best to schedule uh, Leonard Hamilton and, and, uh, and Miami. Yeah. And they just were not, they were not having any <laughs> of that. Like they were, the, they did what Michigan should have done, which was say, yeah. no. I, that's that will always be a trying to get these those two on the schedule for right. it'll always be a, a point of but shout out to michigan for for coming yeah, down like, like i said they you put a scare at them in ann arbor and they said all right we'll, we'll play anyway and, and and obviously that's one of the more memorable games uh and u.s century bank arena at the time uh you you and carlos you and carlos arroyo look fiu is a huge school man like forty thousand plus top five in roman in the country but the basketball history, not as big. It's more. It's a mid-major, Conference USA now. You two are a major part of the basketball history. And then for you to have that journey, to go from knowing what you two accomplished at FIU to being teammates in the NBA on the Utah Jazz, did you two kind of have a sense of, I don't know, representing that school with the smaller basketball history on the big stage? Like both knowing where, where you came from and wanting to, to represent that that yeah, stage of your life absolutely at 100 i think we both wore if you watched either one of us play it was in our own way but we all had we both had that chip on our shoulder of yeah. of you know coming out of coming out of fiu and people probably not respecting who we were as as a team as a university and as individual basketball players you know what i mean so yeah we played with that we we talked about that um you know it was pretty cool and those were those were great you know, times before Carlos got traded, when I got to join up with him in, 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 uh, in Utah and really represent, I mean, it's rare. I, I mean, I don't, you know, I haven't looked that up on basketball reference or anything. Yeah. How, how often you get in a league like the TAC or the Sun Belt, a, a, a legitimate pro backcourt where you have two, seven, eight to 10 year pros, like starting in your backcourt exactly. at the same time. That's a rare thing. Yeah. And cer- certainly one, you, a lot of memories and accomplishments at FIU and then able to parlay that to the NBA. People often associate you with the Phoenix Suns and you had great moments with other teams as well. But, but even those Raja who, who followed your career, if I name the teams, uh, the Sioux Falls sky force, <laughs> the, the Yakima sun Kings, the, the freaking, the Tampa Bay wind jammers. Okay. Pe- people would, people would be like, well, what about them? What, what the heck about them? They probably no idea that you were a part of all three squads trying to get your NBA shot. Uh, Yakima, the CBA Tampa Bay was in the United States basketball league. Yep. I don't think, I don't think that's the thing. And maybe I don't, I, I don't nah. know anything besides the G league anymore. I don't think that's gone. And, and after the Spurs waved you, I'm reading, then you're playing in a really prestigious league the Miami YMCA and you, you, you break your thumb playing pickup. So I'm saying all that, that delayed your, your start in Sioux Falls even more. So I, I preface this with all that to say at that point in time, did the dream of NBA ball still seem feasible to you when you're sitting on the bench at the Miami Y with the, with the broken thumb? Yeah. <laughs> trying, yeah. You know? 
Yeah, man. There, there were some times where you questioned whether or not like it was ever going to happen, you know, like I at FIU, I mean, you referenced us beating Penn State, you know, shake again would schedule anyone. So we went out to the Arizona, you know, Christmas tournament where, you know, Arizona's there, Penn State's there, there are four teams. And then they're, you know, the other two teams are just, you know, cupcakes for those two yeah, teams to advance chance, to the yeah. finals. Right. Yeah. And so we popped Penn State and Calvin Booth and, and, and that team. Um, Jossie Hurd and those guys. And so we get Jason Terry. They won national championship, I think, the year before. And so they had Jason Terry, Luke Walton, A.J. Bramlett, and all those guys. We were beating them deep into the second half, like deep into the second half. Um, and it was obvious that the refs weren't going to let us go in there and win that, right? Like they fouled me out on an offensive <laughs> foul trying to post Jason Terry up with five minutes left in the game. But okay. after that tournament, um, I had uh, one scout come over to me. Um, okay. Man, why can't I call his name? And he was the only scout that ever approached me. And he was like, look, we're, I wasn't here to see you. I was here to see a bunch of other kids on these teams. He was like, but, you know, if I'm being honest, I had you rated as probably the highest player at the event. And I thought, you know, that was the only thing that gave me any indication aside from my, you know, just dream that I would ever be able to play in the NBA, right? So okay. they were the only team that gave me a workout coming out and they didn't draft me. And so, yeah, when I was sitting there having played in the, the CBA – and, and the USBL, people don't understand the USBL. I'm going to tell you a story. I don't know if you got yeah. time. USBL went like yeah. this. Okay. Um, you get drafted and you drive up to like Palm Beach. We're a Tampa Bay team, but we practice at Palm Beach Community College. So you drive up, you know, an hour every day. You have practice, you come back, right? You rarely get paid. When it's time to go on a road trip, you know, they they fly you commercial, which is fine. Um, but your whole team, which is 12 guys, probably six five and bigger, are fitting into like three, four Tauruses. And you get off in D.C., and you play that night in D.C. and you load those cars up and you yeah. drive all the way to Pennsylvania um, and you get to Pennsylvania, you play the next day. But as a rook, they would drop off two garbage bags at my door at like seven in the morning uh, after we got in at like two thirty. And I'd have to go sit in the laundromat all morning and wash everybody's jocks, socks, uniforms, hand that back out and go out and play again tonight. Boom, back in the cars. We're on to Atlantic City. And that just happens for five games and then you're back home. It was a man's man's leap. Like there was if basketball wasn't a love of yours, you don't survive that. Um, and so I drew on that. Like when I sat, when I sat around, like not signed to teams, like I love this, man. I poured a lot of time into this. Um, and I was fortunate enough to have parents that could, could literally afford to let me take a year chasing my dream. I, I didn't, I wasn't forced to have to pay a bill. You know, I wasn't forced to have to put food on the table for someone. And so I had that year, um, but I always drew on, man, I love this. I've, I've given up too much to quit before the year's up, you know, after that year, I don't know, man, I don't know how long right. I could have chased that making no money, but it, it worked out. Yeah. I was going to ask if, if there was like a timeline for you in terms of just chasing the dream. Cause like, like you said, if you only have one scout in college and then you're bouncing around different minor leagues, I guess at the time of, of hoops at, at some point, maybe that internal clock is saying, I gotta, I gotta wrap this up. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, I, Maybe I just wasn't great enough at like planning and not thinking ahead, but I, I didn't really get to that point with myself. I knew it was there, but I wouldn't yeah. allow myself to like really think about, you know, when I had to stop doing it. And, and sure. you know, all the, all the time you're getting feedback though, like while you're in the CBA and stuff from scouts at three mm -hmm. or eight. Um, now like feedback's just that, right? No one's signing you. It's cool to hear that they think you're good. But at some point, you got to put your money where your mouth you is. You think I'm good so, enough to pay me a, good, a nice paycheck. Correct. <laughs> like, I appreciate the compliment, but let's go. Right. So yeah. I was just, you know, so young and so naive and so fresh out and green. I just didn't really think about, you know, uh, shutting it down. Although it was going to have to happen eventually, you know. <laughs> well, well, then, uh, you know, good fortune happened. Greg, Greg Popovich puts a good word into Philly. And you get a 10 day contract and you end up becoming a huge part of the Sixers getting past Milwaukee in the Eastern finals, I think 10 points in, in that game seven second quarter when the rest of the team was struggling, you kept them afloat. You're, you're, you're guarding Ray Allen. Okay. Raza, that seems like a pretty surreal journey in a short span of time. Uh, it, going from the Y to guarding Ray Allen, it still took a couple of years to become the person who would go on to shoot 48% in the playoffs with the Suns. But at that point in time, the Eastern Finals, I think 2001. At that point, did you feel like you belonged in the league and you turned a corner? Uh, not or not yet? <laughs> yeah, no, I did. I did. Because once yeah. I got there, I remember getting there and telling my dad, man, this is like, this is all I ever dreamed of. I don't care if they want me to 
like get everybody water or grab yeah. towels, like whatever <laughs> that looks like, I got yeah. it, right? Because I don't want to leave here. And then your competitor kicks in after like two weeks of being there and you're like, well, I mean, I'm better than him and I think I could do this better. Not Allen Iverson, of course, but like, yeah. you know, some of those fringe players on their roster that were given the opportunity that you didn't get. So then your inner competitor kicks in and you're like, well, no, nah, I mean, you know, if he's on the roster, I could be on the roster. So yeah. that started to kind of sink in with me. AJ, um, mm -hmm. the impetus for me getting to play was, 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 was Vince Carter. And I don't know if you remember that series. It was the Western Conference semis where him and Allen Iverson had this just amazing display of offensive, like back and forth. And in the midst of Larry Brown trying to figure out how to stop him, he came to me one day in practice because I guarded Allen a lot and I guarded Aaron McKee yeah. and, and I guard George Lynch. So I was, I was traversing like the one, two, three in terms of being able to guard people. So um, he asked me if I could guard him. I was like, yeah, what do you mean? Of course I can guard him. <laughs> fully, fully not understanding the scope of the assignment, but I'm like, yeah, I'm like, what do you mean? Of course I got it. Yeah. Yeah. Now he didn't, he didn't play me, but then he threw me in against, against Ray and, and Glenn and it worked out. And so you have no shot at being in that uh, moment. If you don't firmly believe you're supposed to be there or which probably more of my case, you're just so stupid. You don't realize the gravity of the moment. And I think that was me more than anything. <laughs> yeah. It happened so fast that yeah. I was just like, okay, we're hooping, you know? Hey, maybe that's a better thing, though. Maybe that's better. You don't feel the pressure as much if you're just too right. stupid to realize the gravity <laughs> of the moment. <laughs> you, you mentioned Larry there. Uh, you played for Larry Brown. Uh, I think just took uh, an assistant spot on Penny Hardaway staff yeah, over yeah. at Memphis today. Uh, you played for Larry, Don Nelson, Jerry Sloan, Dan Tony. Uh, have you tried to apply principles or philosophies from any of these guys into your vision for how you approach coaching? Did anything stand out that they did that you always held on to for, for how you want to approach coaching when, when, when you, uh, when you are on the bench that you try to apply? Yeah. Um, so if I'm picking from each one of them, I think like with L with LB, um, I, I like, he had this photographic memory in terms of being able to tell you, what happened on a play four times down the court ago and, right. and really depict what everyone did in that. Right. And so I always felt like if you're going to be a good coach, you can't stop it every minute. Like you got to really be able to watch that game, remember what's taking place. And, 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 and so that was, you know, also LB was really, really tough on PGs and they didn't like it at the time, but <laughs> most of them wound up being really good PGs. And so I I've taken that from LB, like I'm a little tougher on PGs, than anyone yeah. else. And they've got a lot of responsibility, you know? And so that, and really understanding what's going on from play to play um, from Jerry Sloan, it was his defensive like mindset, um, the way he was tough as nails, but really fair. And he didn't buy into the politics. Um, yeah. It didn't really matter where you came from or, you know, what school was in front of your name. If, if you earned your keep in his mind and, and checked the boxes, as far as he was concerned on the court, right. You, you were rewarded. And so I always tried to be really fair like that with players. Like, I, look, man, I don't care what you, you know, what the star rating is when you come in here, but you know, if you do your job and hold, hold it down the way we need it held down, we got a spot for you. So that's him. And then Mike and, and, and Nelly were, you know, Nelly was more of a matchup guy. So, right. you know, I'm a big believer and I know you don't post up a lot in today's NBA and guys call me old school and stuff like that. But <laughs> I mean, when Kevin Durant, like, it's so silly. It's such a silly notion. Like when you saw Kevin Durant, against Milwaukee late in those series, where was he going to get his work? Like he was right. going right down to the mid post, just getting buckets. You know, where does Kawhi work? You know, Devin Booker, like it's never a bad time to exploit a mismatch, mismatch and get a, an easy bucket. And so right. that was from Nelly. And then Mike, who's probably my favorite of all time. It's just, <laughs> you know, uh, let offense kind of flow and empower your players, you know, to be the best version of themselves within what they do. And, Confidence for a player is one thing, but a coach yeah. displaying confidence in that player helps the player with his confidence, regardless of how confident he is. It's a lot of confidence, but that's the, the point is show those guys confidence, tell them how much you believe in them. Don't yeah. overanalyze everything they do. And so those were just little bits and pieces. I don't, I'm not always great at it though, AJ. I'm gonna keep it a buck <laughs> and I'm fiery. I'm in faces. Yeah. Like I'm yelling, mm -hmm. but in a perfect world, like those would be the pieces that I took away. <laughs> if you could have combined them at the right place at the right, right. time. <laughs> no, pre pretty high level guys. Um, I, I know you were back on campus in, in 2012 for, for graduation. You finished your degree. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. so, sometime around that time range, 
Uh, you're honored at the at the basketball season opener a, as well, I believe. Uh, so ha- have you had the chance to to get back on campus recently? Have you talked? Have you chopped it up with with Coach Ballard or, or anyone on staff by chance? I think I remember a segment you had with Butch on uh, with Danny a couple of years ago. I can't remember if there was something with Osasu Osagai, who was our our best player around that time as well. But uh, a- any connection with the current program or been on campus recently at all for you? Yeah, first let me give if you don't mind, man. Dr. Yeah. Rob Wolf and, and current ADP Garcia were huge and integral in, into my ability to come back finish. My my coursework, you know, and get that degree that that, awesome. yeah. that has been invaluable to me. Um, and so, you know, it's something I can show my kids. I don't just talk about it. I, I am about it in that regard. So, like, shout out to them. Like, Coach, I mean, Dr. Wolf, man, like, I had him as a student, and he was tough as nails, and we didn't get along. And, you know, he really he really helped me out, and so I'm really grateful and appreciative of the university and him. Um, my parents received, like, they, they did the, the uh, jersey ceremony for me because I was in season. Um, it is a source of so much pride for me, man. Like it's, it is uh, one of the greatest things like to ever happen to me in basketball. Like I didn't get to win an NBA championship. I didn't play in the tournament, but my Jersey hangs at FIU. And so yeah. it is a pretty damn cool thing. Right. Um, I was actually on campus with coach Ballard the other day. I, I met him for the first time awesome. um, at, at one of FIU's football games. I went down into the weight room. Um, Mike, Michael Oliva is one of the, uh, one of the assistants down there and tuna. I, I got tuna. With, yeah, tuna, tuna <laughs> hooks me up. Like I know his dad for a long time in the Miami yeah. high schools. So like if I ever needed tickets to come down and watch games, you know, I go through tuna and he'd hook it up. And so I was on campus and I'm like, yo man, I like to stop by and just say, what's up? Like, are you guys around? They were in the weight room. Um, everybody was super nice and, 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 you know, kind of like, Hey, we'd love to have you around. Cause I, I don't really want to be stepping on people's toes and stuff like sure. that, like, yeah. but I'd love to be around. So I took him up on it and I was, I mean, this was probably last, I don't know, Thursday, maybe uh, Friday, probably Thursday. You know, we went down, I took my son, my dad, um, coach Ballard and, and his coaching staff were great. They, they set up a practice um, plan for us so we could follow along and, you know, gave us the sheets and they ran, you know, the practice wasn't for us, granted. Um, but the practice was a phenomenal practice. The energy in the building was great. The players were great. Um, the coaches were just like on point. Uh, and I, we, we thoroughly enjoyed it. I've been bragging about it, telling my high school team about it. Um, and so I'm excited, man. And hopefully I can be around the program a little more than I have in years past. That's, that's terrific because I, I think, I know Jeremy's a big believer in this too. I think the more a team, a more, the more a program can just embrace the history it does have and the players who help build that foundation. I thought it was really fun. I think two years ago, they did a celebration of that 1995 tournament team you know they had them yeah. in the in the in the suite up there and i think that was the first time a lot of them had been around and i think that's awesome to, to really embrace embrace that concept and, and jeremy's got the ball rolling man i don't know how much you got to talk to. I, last year was all an aberration for everyone everywhere but the sure. first two years i mean the most wins in back-to-back seasons uh, and, and he likes that fast pace too i think number one kim palm tempo in the country he, he like yeah. him and shaky his, the same, his same practice idea. looked like that man they're right. like they're kind of excited though it's good it's fun to watch no, it's awesome. I'm really, really excited about what they can do moving, uh, moving into the next season. Well, Roger, we, we always enjoy listening to you on, on Canel and Bell. You're on the Ringer Networks na- Network now, uh, Real Ones with Raja and Logan. Uh, your post-NBA journey appears to be a, a situation in which you're exploring a lot of cool things, whether it be the podcast and the media side, uh, being in the front office for that period of time with Cleveland and David Griffin, uh, coaching. So how, how much fun are you having right now, man? I'm having a blast, man. There's a lot of stuff that, uh, you know, you don't have time for when you play. I mean, it's a big yeah. sacrifice. It's a great reward, but it's a big sacrifice. And so, you know, my favorite thing is just being around my kids, man, like being around my wife and kids and getting to be in gyms and on football fields and at, at, at soccer games like that, you know, I get to go fishing with them and stuff like that. Like I'm around. And so that makes me really happy. Um, and then, you know, figuring out, what professionally fulfills me has been a, you know, a, a cool thing to go through too. Like you referenced yeah. trying my, 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 my chops in the NBA again. And then I think the media is kind of my lane right now because where I am as a, as a family and where we are as a family. And so absolutely, yeah. we're having a blast, man. It's, it's, it's good stuff. And, and having, um, you know, like the FIUs of the world welcome you back and have that as a part of your world, you know, and have your kids be around that and stuff has been rewarding too. And hopefully yeah. will continue to be. 
Yeah, I've been seeing your, your photos and posts on Twitter uh, of what you've been able to, to uh, is Dia, is that, is that right? Did I say something right? What's yeah, Dia's my 14 Dia, year Yeah, old. yeah, being able to experience those those camps. That's that's what it's all about, man. Um, that, yeah. That's pretty awesome. I know you're you're really enjoying that. And, and I'll say this now because I keep spending hours and, and too much money on it, so I've got to extend the offers now when, when I get the chance. If you're ever trying to play nine holes, let me know, all right? I might, <laughs> I might shoot a 50 or a 55, <laughs> yeah. just trying trying to get on the links with people. So if you got some downtime, we'll, we'll head out to, 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 to the links here. And get, get yeah, some, I don't know, go. do you golf? Do you golf? I feel such like a cliche late 20s person when I ask because that's what everyone <laughs> in the late 20s starts doing is playing golf. Do you golf? Yeah, I'm a huge golfer. I mean, I haven't played um, – it, it, as much recently just because you know life's yeah. kind of taking over and stuff but <laughs> post-career man i spent like three years just like golfing and just doing yeah. that you know and yeah. so yeah i love golf man i'm an avid golf yeah we'll, we'll have we'll have to hit, hit the course sometime soon but yeah. I, I know i have to hit the range a couple more times first before i get back out on <laughs> the yeah. card again. Good, man. Raja bell nba veteran fiu his jersey hangs in the rafters thanks for taking some time man we appreciate it and thanks for having me man. pause up you know it yes sir pause up